<coughs> now, what's this about rules for pa's and sons? This first. Hmm. The 75-cent rule. The 75-cent rule. I don't, uh, I don't believe I ever heard of that one. Well, and that's what I figured. Hmm. What it is, Pa, is that nowadays, kids get 75 cents a week allowance instead of 25 cents. 75 cents? That's a lot of money. And in a year's time, I'd come to see there's 52 weeks in a year. It comes to around $40 a year. <laughs> That's an awful lot of money for a young. They get it, Pa. They do, huh? And they don't have to work for it like I do. Hmm. Well, who is this, uh, this they you keep talking about? Oh, Arnold Winkler and everybody. Arnold Winkler. I don't believe I know him, do I? They're new from Raleigh. Oh, I see. And, and the Raleigh rules say, uh, say 75 cents and no work, huh? I guess. <laughs> you want it straight, don't you? Mm-hmm. Okay, here it goes. <laughs> there are no rules for pa's and sons. Uh, it's as simple as this. Each, uh, each mother or father raises his boy or girl, as the case may be, the way that uh, he thinks is best. And I think it's best for you to give a quarter and work for it. You see, when you give something, in this instance, clean the garage, and you get something in return, like a quarter, well, that's the greatest feeling in the world. You do feel good after working, don't you? Uh-huh. Good and tired. <laughs> well, as, uh, as you get bigger, well, you'll be doing more and more work for more and more return, and that good feeling will get bigger. Do you understand what I mean? I think so. Good. I'm not going to get 75 cents. <laughs> And I have to work for the 25. Right. It's all clear to you? Yeah. The bigger you get, the tireder you get. <laughs> well, uh, you just you just think about that for a while. Do I have to? Don't you want to think about it? It makes me kind of sad. <laughs> well, the thing to do when you're feeling sad is to shoot for the good feeling. Clean the garage. Right. It's a long ball. A long ball. <laughs> <sighs> Don't you wish it was still just that simple? Yeah. You know, back in the day when, you know, you could drink water out of the garden hose. Yeah, Love that. No, it doesn't, water doesn't taste any better than that. Hey, so uh, I have the opportunity to uh, speak with you guys today. It's so cool to see, there's, Mindy and I have been coming here for, coming on two years now, and just so many new faces. And uh, the word must have gone out that I'm a wet mouth preacher because the front rows are totally empty and all the back chairs are full. So uh, you guys are good. I, I don't think it'll go quite that far. So my name's Chris Hain and uh, my wife Mendy, uh, affectionately referred to as the redhead, is sitting right there. And Dave, Pastor Dave, you guys love our pastor? He's awesome. He is awesome. I love that guy. He uh, decided to go to Germany and say to me, Chris, I need you to preach the money message. <laughs> So there we go. We're going to talk about money this morning. And actually, I'm not going to probably go the direction that we're typically accustomed to when the money talk happens, right? I, I uh, uh, will touch on a few things, but I think it's, uh, it, it's good for us to get a perspective on what does God really think about money? What does he think about it? How does that connect with us? And I will tell you guys that um, this is a topic that uh, is going to touch every one of us, okay? I have, I have two jobs as a preacher of the word, to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable, okay? So some of you are probably going to feel some affliction today. Some of you will probably feel comforted, I hope. But um, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about what God thinks about money. And, and please excuse me, I went fly fishing on Friday, and my glasses ended up in the vehicle that is now somewhere in Iowa. So bear with my blindness as I use my, my reading glasses this morning. But we're going to look at some scripture, and I want you to focus on some things that, that, that God says about money, both in the negative and the positive, all right? Now, we're in election season right now. We're hearing a lot of money talk. I went through a couple of statistics. Some of you guys might know this stuff already, but just kind of what's going on out there in terms of debt, what's happening. I got a slide up here. You might not be able to see all the numbers, but let me read this to you. This is 2014 numbers, okay? 
Uh, the average family has 15,762 bucks in credit card debt, representing 733 billion in our country. Billion with a B. All right. Mortgages average 168, 8.25 trillion. Go on down. You got auto loans, student loans. That's a massive issue. Look at this one. Any type of debt represents 12 trillion. That's 12,000 billions. That's massive, you guys. There's another pie chart up here. What does the average person spend, okay, this, on, on just their monthly budget? You know, you got, you got transportation, 17%. Housing's a pretty big one at 33. Clothing, three. Wow, okay. Um, <laughs> healthcare, 8%. I can tell you healthcare probably represents more than 8% of our deal right now. It's kind of crazy. Personal insurance. Look at this food one. 13%. 42% of that is eating out. Almost half we spend in eating out. Which, is that more expensive or cheaper than eating at home? More expensive. Okay. Just a snapshot of kind of what's going on out there. Uh, some of you might be able to, to resonate with some of this. Now, I want to read some passages of Scripture here, and it's going to be quite a few, and these focus on what does God think about money in terms of how it's being used in, in, in people in the Bible, and what they did with it, and some of, the, some of the truths surrounding that. Listen to this one. This is in Ecclesiastes 5.10. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This is so meaningless. Kind of bad, kind of negative right there. First Timothy 6.10 says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Maybe you know some folks like that. Maybe you feel <laughs> pierced with many griefs. Because of the love of money. All right. Uh, Proverbs 23 5 says, Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off into the sky like an eagle. And of course, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not destroy break in and steal. Now here's where there's a little bit of a, I think some confusion that I have found in the church world when it comes to money. And I've been in ministry in the past about 15 years, grew up in my teen years in the church. And I remember used, I used to hear this, this, this undercurrent that would say, money is bad. Money is bad. That's not true. Money is, money is uh, picture it like this. It's a brick. It doesn't have emotion. It doesn't act on its own. It gets acted upon. And unfortunately, like we just read, by irresponsible people that won't take responsibility for their actions involving that money. And then we get all spiritual about it and spiritualize it and say, well, therefore, God hates money because look how terrible their lives are. And money's just this awful thing. Now the real question comes down to, what's your perspective about money? What, do you, what, are, what is your thought process about money? And what actions do you take based out of that thought process? Now there's also some positive things that God has to say about money. I love this one. This is in 1 Chronicles chapter 29 where King David, he's dead. He, he has now gone on to heaven and served this amazing life. You know, David was known as a man after God's own heart. We also know about David. He made some fairly poor decisions in his leadership, okay? First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 26 to 28 says this, David, son of Jesse, was king over all of Israel. He ruled over Israel 40 years, seven in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. He died at a good old age, having enjoyed long life, wealth, and honor. And his son Solomon succeeded him as king. God bestowed wealth and honor upon him. David understood as he began to grow and really mature in God and be that godly leader that Israel needed, how money worked, how, how to handle it, how to think about it, how to utilize it. 
We all know the story of Job. Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, say, talking about Job being the, the most blameless man and, and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. Whoa. Seven sons and three daughters. Okay. I get the seven sons part. Three daughters. I have three. That's a... We've had a good time. Yeah. And he, off, and he owned 7,000 sheep... We have six goats, and I don't know how he does this. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys at all. Large number of servants. The, the guy was loaded, okay? He was loaded. And yet, he feared God and shunned evil. He understood how money works. He understood its proper place in his life. And then Matthew 27, verse 57. This is after Jesus had been crucified, and he's being taken off the cross. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. And going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. You know, Joseph was in a position from a wealth standpoint, from a resource standpoint, to take care of the body of our Lord. So we see both positive and negative here. Okay, and so the question comes is, you know, what are some of the negative characteristics that we read about? Money can be very deceptive if we think wrongly about it and act wrongly about it. It's fleeting, okay? You can't take it with you. I've done plenty of funerals in my ministry years, and there was just, I never saw an open casket that had cash laying in it. Never saw that. You know what I did see? Pictures of family. Things that are eternal, you know, memories of relationships. Money can be, it's very temporary. It's fleeting. It can be vain in our pursuit of it, okay? But it also has some positive characteristics. Those that knew how to handle it understood that it belongs to God. It belongs to God. It helped them build a disciplined life. And they grew patience in the process. How many of you have learned patience through handling money? Your own finances. It'll test it, won't it? Yeah. An attitude of gratitude seems to be present with those that know how to deal with money. But I think there's a larger question we need to focus on. Not necessarily about, is money good? Is money bad? But the, I think the underlying issue has to come into to, 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 to bearing here of what's the secret of knowing how to deal with it? What, what, is, what is it that some people just seem to get it with money and other people just don't seem to get it with money? And sometimes some of those outward evidences can be fairly obvious. You know, you're, you're, you're dealing with maybe some particular financial struggles of, of one sort or another. And what do we often do? We go to somebody, say, hey, I need you to help me with this. I need you to talk to me about this. I don't know what to do. And we typically go to our, you know, our broke uncle who's in debt. And, you know, great guy to get advice from, you know. And uh, I run into that a lot in my industry. Well, I went to so-and-so, and they said I should do this. And is that person wealthy? Oh, no, no. He's got $80,000 worth of college debt. Okay, I probably wouldn't go to him for advice. All right, we, we, And we, we're just desperate to find out how do we get out of the mess that we're in, right? How do I begin to think right about all that? So we're going to focus on what the secret is, and we're going to go into um, some, some chatter that has happened over the last couple of weeks or so in our church about that. We, we threw out a question. Uh, Suzanne uh, helped me with this and went out to some of the life group leaders, and we put it on the church uh, website about what are some of the the lessons and some of the the growing points that you guys have experienced in terms of um, money what has God been doing in your life what are some of the things that have changed in the last you know 12 months this year whatever and so it's kind of funny there was some some chatter on Facebook I got a slide up here I know you guys probably won't be able to read some of this but Leslie Kotwika, hi Leslie, <laughs> she, she talked about that, that they've taken in a family of 10 since the end of November. Not only do they live here rent free, but we also employ them and pay for their salary. This is in no way bragging, but it is difficult. It, this, this is not possible, any way possible that we could have done this on our own. God has made the provision for us to do this. I would hazard a guess 
you guys are thinking like, you know, this stuff doesn't really belong to us. It's not ours. You know, John Wesley's a great theologian that I, I love to follow and I love his teaching. He says this really powerful thing about, about when it comes to money. He says, you need to earn all you can so you can save all you can so that you can give all you can. It's meant to be given away, you guys. It's, it's an open hand kind of an of a, of a attitude. God brings it in and it goes right out. Those of us that live life with a clenched fist, okay? Yeah, you hold on to what you have, but nothing can come in, and certainly nothing's going to go out, okay? I love what uh, uh, Stacy talked about, that she had, she had some folks, that, a, a person that she didn't really know, give her some money. Just felt like this person said, I, God told me to give this to you. You needed this. And she was like, you know, hey, listen, I got, I got issues with my own finances, but I don't know what to do with this money. And as she was obedient and trusted the Lord in that, God enabled her to give that to someone else. It was, it was just awesome to see what's happening spiritually in the lives of some of our people. How many of you guys know Chip from Villar? You guys know Chip? Some of you know Chip? Okay. Chip and Kim are just an awesome family. Great servants here. And uh, I had asked Chip to come up and tell a story, and I got a resounding no to come up on the platform. So that's all right. That's all right. But um, I want to be kind of real with you guys here for a second. Uh, I don't think I'm the only one that struggles with this. How many of you have the tendency that when you meet someone, in the first 90 seconds, you form a judgment about them? Am I the only one that does that? No. We form an opinion. I, I am, Doug. I'm the only one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And, and so, and, and we tend to do that at church. We tend to do that in the workplace, in our neighborhoods. We just sort of size people up, right? We really don't know their story, but we kind of go with the outward appearance. We just kind of look at that and go, well, that's probably where these guys are at. This is probably what they're all about. And I did that with Chip. Now, Chip is a great man. I mean, a good-looking guy. I mean, from a manly side, good-looking <laughs> Okay, and he, uh, he's, uh, you know, just serves here in the church and gr great to have conversation with him. He's so personable. And I had sized him up and I said this in my head about him. Well, Chip's got it all together. That dude looks like he's just on the rocket ship to success. He's got great things going on in his life. He's just, he's, he's financially independent. He's, he just has that look and Kim looks sharp and their family looks sharp. You know, we base it all on outward appearance, don't we? And I heard his story last night. We talked on the phone for about 15, 20 minutes. Untrue. Wrong again, Chris. And what God has done in his life and the struggles that they've been through, and God has touched his heart particularly about the tithe. And he said, I never thought, it never occurred to me to put God first in my finances. And he said, I've been on a six-month journey of trusting in the Lord with the tithe. Unbelievable growth has happened in his life. The man has matured in the Lord. And God has done other things as well to validate that when you put him first, God has room to work. It's so incredible to see that happen in the lives of people. We're going to take a look at a passage of, of scripture that's going to be our key passage. I'd like you guys to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, and we're going to look at verses 10 through 13, and then verse 19. And this morning, I want to make sure that we are free of excuse of, I just didn't hear from God this morning, and I really just didn't understand what the word was saying this morning, and I still don't get it. So we're going to bump up the lights just a little bit so you guys could see really good in your Bibles and on your phones. So I really want you to see these words because they're powerful. This is Paul, okay? We're going to read about Paul who uh, had just started the Philippian church. Now, you remember the story of Paul at Philippi, right? What happened to him and Silas? They got thrown down in a jail cell, which was basically a hole in the ground. And God intervened, and the place came apart, their chains fell off, and what a miraculous story took place. That was the beginning of this church in Philippi. So this is Paul now talking to this church. He says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. 
I am not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Verse 13, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And then verse 19, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Now, as you look at your Bible, if you've got a Bible with pages and ink and all that stuff on it, if you have one of those, you may only have the part underlined or circled that's verse 13. I could do all things through Christ who gives me strength, right? Some of you even have it tattooed on your body. I've seen it, okay? It's like, that's an awesome verse, man. All things. And, and typically, all things are all good things. The bad stuff that happens, well, that meant that God fled the scene. And I have to figure this all out on my own. And when the money's not coming and the bills aren't getting paid and I'm stressing about it, then those are things I can't do and certainly God isn't going to help me with that so I'm just going to take over and figure it out myself. And this previous verses 10 through 12 about being content and understanding the secret of contentment, whether I have plenty or I don't have anything, that's for like other super spiritual people or folks that are dead already. All right, that doesn't, that's not real world because I don't experience any contentment. And when stuff is happening, I'm upset, I'm stressed, and I feel like I got no answers. And then I make decisions when I shouldn't be making decisions and doing things apart from maybe what God's word says. Contentment, joy, are you kidding me? I'm broke. I'm in debt. Give to the church. Uh, well, okay. When things clear up for me, okay, when I get it all figured out, then we can talk about that. But no, I, I like verse 13 because that's nice and powerful. Then this other part that says, and my God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Well, again, that's probably, that's probably for the wealthy people. That's probably who that's for. And we just make all this head trash up because we have wrong thinking about money, okay? I can say personally that for the 15 years that I spent in ministry and then growing up in my teen years and being around the church, I remember in many church situations, money was bad. If you had money, then you weren't really spiritual. The real spiritual people don't have money. And they, they just learn to live this very meager existence and this, this kind of worm theology that's like, oh, bless God. You know, I'm just so much joy in Jesus, you know. <laughs> really? Dude, you're all bent over, man. You, you, I don't, you look like you've been sucking on sour lemons all day long. I don't see any joy. I don't see any contentment. So this, this stuff goes on in your head like, well, I, I can't, if I have money, I'll mess it up and I'll do this. How about we think about what the secret of that contentment is? What is the meaning of this? Paul discovered it. Somehow, Paul figured out the secret of it all. And that secret is one page back in your Bible. Just one page. I want you to go to chapter 3. Chapter 3 of Philippians. This is, this is really good. This should be underlined in your Bible. So, chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 says this. This is Paul, again, still talking to these same people. But whatever it was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more? I consider everything, including money, a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ. The, new, the, the message calls that rubbish word dog poop. That I would consider it dog poop compared to the riches of Christ Jesus. The secret of what Paul learned here was it ain't about whether I have money or don't have money. What it's all about is Christ central. Amen. Is he Lord? 
Now, some of you, hopefully many of you, prayed a prayer, whether you were a kid when you prayed this, or you were uh, maybe later in life, teenager, maybe an adult, you prayed a prayer that said this, Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. Remember that prayer, Dave? I admit that I'm lost without you, and I need a Savior, and I need your forgiveness, I need you to come into my life, and I want you to be the Lord of my life. I remember praying that prayer when I was 23 years old. And we're like, woohoo, yeah, here we go, you know? And we get baptized, and we get in a Bible study, or we get connected with a church, and all this great stuff is happening. All of a sudden, it kind of slows down. And then these issues come up. I'm going to call them lordship issues. These little issues come up where it's like, well, Chris, now, I remember when you were 23 years old, you prayed that I would be the Lord of your life, and like now you're kind of taking control of that. You know what was for me? Money. Money. And I would not give that over to the Lord. I want to use a little uh, analogy here. Maybe some of you can relate with this. this is, these are my keys. And uh, these keys that I have on my key ring represent things in my life, okay? Uh, this is my work key. Uh, no, this is the house key. A couple of work keys, a couple of car keys. <clears throat> Imagine your life being a house, okay? Roll with me here, all right? Imagine your life being a house, and this house has many rooms in it, Okay? Uh, some of you live in some houses, have four or five bedrooms, whatever, living room, a couple bathrooms. Got, and there's doors, okay, to all these rooms. And each of those doors have a key. Now, the day that you received Jesus Christ was the day when you said, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I want you to be my Savior, my Lord, my God. I, I just I want to live this new life with you. I want to turn from the past and, 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 and live for you. Right? And you welcome Jesus into the entryway of your house. You open the front door, right? And you say, come on in, Jesus. Come on in. And, and he comes in and, you know, Revelation 3.20 says that he will come in with us and be with us and have dinner with us and fellowship with us, right? And so we're sitting down in this, in this entryway. And it's beautiful, you know, Jesus in your house. And, and you're having a talk, right? And you're loving that talk. And all of a sudden, Jesus kind of, he looks over your shoulder. He goes, hey, uh, that, uh, that room down the hallway, that door's shut. And you're like, yeah, yeah. Well, I'd like to be in that room too. Oh, that room. That room with all that bad past. Ugh. Lord, can't we like deal with that one later on? No, no, Chris, actually, I, I, I could go in and I can clean that room and I can, make it, I can make it fresh and new and get rid of all the darkness and the cobwebs. But Chris, you got, you got to let me have the key. And so reluctantly as I... I'm, I'm nervous about that. I'm kind of scared. But I say, all right, Jesus, here's the key. Whew. You can go in that room. And sure enough, he does what is promised, and he goes and cleans out that room, right? And so then I have another conversation with Jesus, and, and we're, we meet in the entryway of the house, and, and we go check out this clean room, and I feel so good that it's clean. And he goes, whoa, 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 hang on, hang on now. That door right on the other side, that one's locked too. And I... I'd kind of like to go in that room. Oh, you mean the room with my addictions? <laughs> that room? Well, I'm going to therapy. I'm, I'm reading a book about that, Jesus. I, I'll, I'm good with that. Well, no, actually, Chris, I'd, I'd like to go in that room and do the same thing I did in this room. And so with trepidation and nervousness, I love my Lord, and I, I remember what he did, and I remember him cleaning that room, and so I give him another key. And I said, okay, Lord, you can go in that room too. And he goes in and he does as he's promised. They will make all things new. And it's great. And this process goes on and he, and he eventually, and I think each of us have this same door in our house of our soul, the money door. That one's a big door. That's a thick door because we think we got to figure it out. And again, the Lord Jesus comes and he says, I would love to get inside that room and make it all clean because it's a nightmare right now. You're in debt up to your eyeballs. You're living outside of your means. You're not trusting me. I'd like to go in to that room and give it a clean. And that's one that we struggle with. 
But this conversation keeps on coming. Now I want to tell you what lordship is. The Lord Jesus comes in. He comes in the entryway of your house. He sits down. You have a conversation. You got a few rooms clean, but there's a few that aren't. And Jesus asks you this question, and he asks it of me. I remember the day he asked it of me, July 13th, 1996. I remember it. And he says, Chris, you know, we've been asking about room keys for quite a few years. And I'd like to know if I can have the master key. And I'd like to know if I can have access to every room of your house. And I'm nervous. And I know that that means the Lord is going to get to go to places that I've been keeping locked up for a really long time, including the money door, my addiction door, my anger door, my irresponsibility door, and all these rooms. And I finally hand him the master key. And I say, Lord, you can go to every room you want to go. That's lordship. That's when Jesus says, now let me teach you how to think about money. Now let me teach you how to deal with the addiction. And it's one easy step. The Lord says, I'll deal with it. Do you know why I went to the cross? To deal with your whole house. And you guys, when it comes to money, this is an area we hold on to with a death grip. And I think we would learn the secret of what Paul discovered when we just give it to him. Now, maybe some of you are, that, that's an issue you turned over to God. He's got that. But maybe this is an opportunity to say, what other lordship issue is there in my life that I just haven't given him? I need to give him the master key. We keep talking about all these other rooms, and if you're on that journey, great, but no, it's not going to stop until Jesus gets the master key. And personally, and for my family, I could tell you, that's when the contentment comes. And there's nothing else like it. So I would just like us to end with a prayer. And I want to give you an opportunity to deal with whatever lordship issue there might be about whatever door it is in your guy's life, in your house of your soul, that the key hasn't been turned over. And he wants to take it and make it clean and make it new and make it God-glorifying. We're just going to stand together, and I'd like us to, to take a moment of prayer. We're going we're gonna to talk to God right now, and I want this to be a one-on-one, -on -one, okay? A one-on-one -on -one conversation that you have with the Lord right now. This is your opportunity to listen. This is your opportunity to, to respond. And I just, I just want to just open up this time of prayer. And uh, I think the praise team is going to come up too. We're going we're gonna to sing that last song, How Great Is Our God. We're going to sing that, just a couple verses of that song. But I want you to just close your eyes right now. And we're not looking around. This is you and God time, okay? You and God time right now. We're bowing our heads and we're asking God this lordship question, this, this secret of contentment question. God, where am I at with that? Lord Jesus, I need you to shine a light into the darkness of, of, of the area of my heart that I just have not turned over to you. And maybe, maybe Lord, it, it's about money. I can tell you, Lord, I struggle with it. I stress about it. My relationships are in turmoil over it. Whatever it is, God, you know it. And God, I just, I just want to bring this to you right now. And so our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed. I'm, I, just, I just want you guys to respond, okay? I'm just, I'm praying for you right now. I'm praying for every one of your hearts right now. 
And I'd like you to just put your hand in the air. If there's an area of lordship you have not given over to God and you want to deal with that, you just put your hand up. This is just you and God. You just put your hand up and say, Lord, I, I, I've got something I'm hanging on to. Awesome. Man, I'm seeing, I'm seeing God move here. And he, he, wants, he wants that key. So I'm going to ask you, as we sing this song, to take a step toward God. You know what? We'll just make this front step here. These, these stage steps and altar. A place to come and meet Lord. God will meet you where you're at. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes we've got to take a step toward Him. And, and uh, moving our bodies to say, Lord, I, I am serious about this. I am, I am intentional about this. And I want to bring this to you. As we sing this song, this area is open. If you want to come pray and just, and just say, God, I'm giving you the key. I'm giving it to you. It's yours. And we'll just trust the Holy Spirit to move as we sing this song. You give life. You are love. You bring life to the darkness. You give hope. You pour out our hearts to you your word is clear the truth is simple there's nothing complicated about this Lord it's an act of trust and belief in you that you are all sufficient you are central Lord nothing on this earth can replace you and it's not meant to replace you. We were created, Lord, to have you be all and in all. And so, Lord, as a church, as a body of believers crying out to you, we say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I thank you, God, for your word, its truth, its power. It has the power to change lives. And I ask, Lord God, that your word would just soak into our thinking and into our hearts and that Lord we would take action on what we've learned on what's been revealed to us and walk in faith and walk in humility and walk in expectation God of the change that you want to bring we pray this all in the awesome and holy and mighty name of Jesus Christ Amen